Welcome to Space News from the Electric Universe, brought to you by the Thunderbolts Project at thunderbolts.info. Astronomers today are puzzling over the unexpected brightening of a recently discovered comet. On October 20th, an observer in Japan noted that the brightness of comet X1 Linear was over 100 times greater than astronomers' expectations. On October 21st, astronomers in New Mexico confirmed the surprising outburst. Other cometary displays have captured the world's attention in recent years. In 2007, the periodic comet Home 17P stunned the science world when it abruptly brightened by a factor of about half a million, making its coma temporarily the largest object in the solar system. Astronomers attribute these cometary outbursts to the sublimation of ices from solar heating. But does this explanation fit with the facts? Why are we surprised when comets flare up unexpectedly? I think the answer lies in the fact that we don't understand comets. It's as simple as that. The story of comets is associated with the story of the formation of the solar system. And the story of the formation of the solar system is a once upon a time story dreamt up centuries ago, which has merely been patched as new information comes to light. You would have expected that close flybys of comets and the capture of material from the tail of a comet would have been sufficient evidence to make people consider some other alternative ideas. But this hasn't happened. So we continue to be surprised by comets. Now comets in the electrical model flare up simply because they are suddenly caused to discharge either by a sudden change in their environment brought about by charged particles from the sun suddenly arriving or by a gradual change in voltage as the comet approaches the sun or recedes from the sun and that voltage is impressed across the interior of the comet because the comet in effect acts a bit like a capacitor and if you over stress a capacitor it explodes. They can be quite dangerous. This is why capacitors have a voltage rating on them. So this gives a very simple explanation for these flarings and so on of comets, but it also explains why just recently an asteroid produced a coma and a tail as it swung around the sun. And asteroids are not supposed to produce cometary displays. And the question there was, how do you machine all this? How do you get this dust to come off the comet? And there's no good answer to that in the standard theory because that relies on evaporating, sublimating ices and so on buried out of sight inside the comet nucleus. I say out of sight because when you look at comets from images sent back by spacecraft flybys and so on, beginning with Halley, you see a surface which is extremely dark, darker than soot. There's no sign of ices generally. There are some white spots, but the question is what are those white spots? They don't necessarily mean ices. And you also see sculptured surfaces. Now, if a body is just evaporating in sunlight, you would expect to see a, an object that looks a bit like a melting ice cream, or you would expect to see material coming off it in a cloud. Cometologists also struggle to explain the highly collimated jets of material that sometimes explode from cometary surfaces. What is seen from comets are thin filamentary jets and there's some good examples which are shown here. Now, to get gas to expand in a filament requires a very finely machined nozzle. So the suggestion that material is being shot from beneath the surface by expanding gases doesn't make much sense. The standard explanation for these jets is that material is being sublimated, turned from solid ice to a gas beneath the surface, punches a hole in the surface and then emerges as a jet. But these jets should be misshapen. Instead of that, we see highly collimated jets, ones that are obviously under the control of some external force to maintain their integrity over vast distances. None of this fits any explanation involving just heat and an icy substance in the sunlight. Why is it assumed that the material that is sublimating from comets, according to theory, is water ice. The answer is the hydroxyl radical, that's an oxygen atom and a hydrogen atom, are found in the comas of comets. Now the standard explanation for that is, of course, that the ultraviolet light from the sun, which is quite intense, breaks up the water molecules into its constituent parts, one of which is the hydroxyl radical, the OH. However, 
ultraviolet light will split water up into positive ions. It strips electrons off and leaves positively charged parts of the water molecule behind. But some of the earliest observations of comet nuclei showed that very close to the comet nucleus, and this was found at Comet Halley, there is an abundance, about 100 times anything that was expected, of negative ions. Now, negative ions are produced in an electric discharge from a cathode surface, and this is what's been discovered. Cathode jets also create highly collimated filaments. All of these things fit the observations. None of the standard theory fits the observations. An opportunity to test the explicit predictions of the electric comet theory came in 2005 with NASA's Deep Impact mission to Comet Temple 1. The test of a new hypothesis is successful prediction. The more unexpected, the better. Using the electrical model of cometary activity, I predicted almost four years in advance, that is when it was announced, that the Deep Impact mission to Comet Temple 1 would produce two flashes. A small flash before impact as the nucleus discharged to the projectile, rather like the spark sometimes as you reach for a metal doorknob. Amongst other things, I also predicted an unexpectedly energetic flash to follow the impact. I wrote back then, the energetic effects of the encounter should exceed that of a simple physical impact in the same way that was seen with Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 at Jupiter. After the event, NASA expert Peter Schultz suggested that the initial flash indicates a layered structure for the comet. And I quote, My guess is there was soft layering on top. The impactor went down and finally got in contact with ISIS. This ad hoc hypothesis of unbelievably fragile outer layers is now treated as an observational fact, a confirmation in the words of deep impact investigator Michael Ahern. Notably, however, the impact released very little water. However, when Temple 1 was revisited by the Stardust spacecraft on February 15, 2011, the expected crater showed no sign of deep penetration. The crater was almost indiscernible, as if the impactor had hit solid rock or partially vaporised before impact. Once again, the ad hoc explanations were weak. I quote, Stuff went up and came back down. And, I quote again, The crater partly healed itself, presumably by some magical effect, but a hard surface might have been anticipated both from the comet's appearance and much earlier evidence from radar returns from Comet Enki that implies a non-porous, probably rock, surface material. This gets down to the fact that uh, comets show a sculptured surface. The puzzling erosion of an escarpment on Comet Temple 1 is simply explained by the tendency of a cathode spark machining to initiate on a sharp edge and electrically etch or sputter extremely fine material progressively back from the edge. The extreme fineness of comet dust was first remarked upon following the encounters with Comet Halley because it wasn't expected of interstellar dust grains. I suggest that the unexplained white spots, which are observed to favour such locations, are active cathode arcs and there's prior evidence for this suggestion. A prediction was made based on the electric universe that the outburst would be much more intense than would be expected from a purely mechanical impact. And the discharge was so intense that the expected images that would be sent back of the uh, comet crater just didn't eventuate. These detectors were overloaded. They just could not film the surface of the comet after the event. The electrical model says that if you introduce an object which is at a completely different charge state to the comet itself, then you will get an electrical outburst. So there was a large amount of electrical energy involved. Also, if you splatter highly conductive copper, vaporized copper, near a charged object, then the other jets that happen to be on the surface of that object at the time will suddenly concentrate in the area of high conductivity. So I also predicted that the jets would move, the ones that existed before, and that was also borne out. For continuous updates on space news from the Electric Universe, stay tuned to thunderbolts.info.